Get started. Um, thank you to everyone. Oh, hey! Uh, thank you for everyone. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, the workplace learning, immersive learning, and the future of what we are going to be faced with as instructional designers, trainers, educators, uh, with the upcoming workforces coming into um, being our entry level employees that we are now trying to onboard and train. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I have an interesting fact that just came out from Forbes. Um, and it came out two weeks ago. By 2025, millennials alone will make up 75% of the workplace, and their average attention span will be 76 seconds. Yeah. That much? 76 yeah. seconds. Lisa's like, I got 35. You're lucky. So we're going to talk a little bit about this today. Today we're in a situation where uh, it's a two-way work street now. Uh, we're running into uh, the days of dictating messages and information to employees is no longer going to be happening. Uh, we're sitting in a situation where businesses are co uh, constantly struggling for competitive advantage. And one of the biggest problems that we have facing us as um, employees and employers is communication breakdown. 99.9% .9 of the material that we do is involved in communication. And that goes for any type of learning. It comes directly from communication. And one of the things that we often don't think about is this two-way street in the relationship with communication. It's constantly coming from us to them to educate them. And one of the things that we're going to see a big shift in is this no longer top-down experience, but more of the social learning and collaborative learning and even immersive learning that we're going to be talking about. So one of the things that we find um, when we work with a lot of companies is they're all kind of faced with the same situation in workplace learning. Um, they're constantly being bombarded by new tools. They're constantly trying to figure out ways to utilize mobile in the workplace. Are we all having the same kind of struggle right now? Um, we're all trying to figure out new principles. We've heard of, the, of using the Agile methodology, the SAM methodology, the Addy methodology, and now they're all blending together and figuring out what we can do with them. And then we also have a ton of different um, analytical tools and, and data and information. And here's what I tell people. I no longer think we're in the age of information. I think we're in the age of instant gratification. And what I mean by that is, most of the people in this room, except for maybe you and Lisa in the back, um, you guys, how many of you get really mad when you text someone and they don't text you right back? Right? Just ready to be honest. It's rude. It's rude, right? You think it. You want to know why? Because you live in the age of instant gratification. You are so ingrained in thinking that if I make an action, a reaction is going to happen instantaneously. And that's what we're at. We're at in a situation where we expect instantaneous to happen at all times. So we're going to talk a little bit about that stuff today. We're also going to be talking about adaptations of technologies, uh, adaptations of immersive learning, and also adaptations of what we're faced with as instructional designers. And the reason why is I'm going to be showing some examples today of different things like robots, augmented reality, and things that will be done today in the classroom that these kids are used to and are adapting and utilizing today that then will come into our workforce expecting a different type of learning, all right? So as you guys know, if anybody is in the K through 12 system, you know that they're having a difficult time with engagement and retention and so on and so forth, and they've realized that, and now they're trying to flip the classrooms on their heads. So we're gonna show some practices and things that have been doing, that are taking place to make that an effective thing. Um, the first thing um, that we're already doing is we're already doing flexible, customized learning plans, right? based around, what do you guys usually do your learning plans over? Is it based around the job role or just the problem? Which one normally happens for you guys? It depends on the client. See, it depends, yeah. yeah. What, I, what I find is it's usually over the problem and not just de developing something completely over the job role. Does that make sense? So what you're gonna see is as we go through um, this whole training realm, we are going to end up working on, on job role problems rather than just building specific learning around a specific issue that we're having today. And that's what we've approached and how we've approached corporate learning for a very long time. Now, what does that mean? Yes, we have onboarding problems or we have um, leadership problems, so on and so forth, but we're only tackling it there rather than tackling it all the way across that job role placement. We also have, um, 
what we're going to see in the future is a lot more ambiguous and embedded and invisible technology that we'll be using um, to train and also at our workstations. What I think is fascinating is, I said by 2050, half the jobs that are in the United States today will no longer exist. Half the jobs. So what are we going to do with half those people? Well, here's what I, I think is interesting. People go, well, doesn't that mean people are going to lose their jobs? No, what that means is it's going to free those people up from doing the job they're doing today to do a better, more efficient job later by having technology utilize and integrate and do that, not necessarily take that away. A great example is you look at the factories, right? This is the problem with the United States society and factories. We never took the time to retrain those people that were working in those job roles, did we? We never retrained them. So what did they say? We lost our jobs to robots. You didn't lose your jobs to robots. You got freed up to go figure out something else to do because robots and computers cannot take over the human capabilities. And it won't happen in our lifetime. So we're kind of in this cusp of talking about the future of learning, so on and so forth. I really feel that a lot of it is here because we're bombarded by all of this information, yet we lack wisdom. And what I mean by that is, how, what do we do with all this information and how do we utilize it? Here's what I think is funny, is if I talk to an industry person here, here are the three things we talk about. Learning modalities, evidence of learning, where the learning environment exists. But human capital, the role of time, and sometimes curriculum and content we talk about, actually curriculum content we talk about a lot. But the role of time and the human capital, we don't talk about a lot. We just talk about the problems that we're faced as instructional designers that we need to build to help these people. Not necessarily talking about the actual human capital and the role of time and the role of those people and those learning modalities for those particular uh, human capital. It's all about solving that initial problem that we have. And if anybody wants these slides afterwards, I will, I have no problem giving them out. Just so you know, this, this graphic was made by one of our graphic designers. She was so proud of it. <laughs> She's like, I made it in Word. I didn't have to use Photoshop. I was like, good for you, girl. Good for you. Because I gave her like a chicken scratch mess. She ran with it. So we're also in a situation where we're bombarded by that information. Um, did you guys know, and I'm going to be showing a video just in a second, that we are sitting in a situation that every second, this is actually um, incorrect, it's 48 hours of um, YouTube content being made every second. So that means that 48 hours of content is being uploaded every second to YouTube. 2,000 websites are being made and 2 billion YouTube videos are being watched daily. So what does that mean? That means we're bombarded by information. Um, how many of you guys have ever seen the Did You Know videos? Yeah, do you remember those from like 2012? Here's a newer one, okay? Hundred thousand tweets. Two million search queries every second. $72,000 is spent every second. So I'll pause there. That's what I mean by we're being bombarded by information, but we don't know what to do with it. We're constantly creating content and information, but we don't have a way to disseminate that in, in a way that is going to be as effective as it should be. So, woo. this is what I often tell people. If your expectations of your employees that you're trying to train look like this, then you're vastly off of what's going to happen. Because it really does look like this, right? We have had people that we have trained where we thought we'd taken through a linear process, and all of a sudden, it goes awry, doesn't it? Um, even if you have a strong curricular plan, curriculum plan set up, uh, you will find that a lot of times the reality is not the same. So let's talk a little bit about what are you guys looking for or what are employers looking for in actual employees? Right now, this, this is from um, uh, Forbes data from last month. This is the top 10 skills employers want to know and want employees to have, okay? 
Some of these are pretty basic, such as ability to work in a team, make decisions and, and problem solve, organize, uh, communicate, um, and tame. And this is the one I think is the most important. This one right here, ability to obtain and process information. We, nine times out of 10, make assumptions that they're gonna be able to process and, and obtain and retain that information. So I was talking to some high school kids. Um, this was about a month, uh, two months ago. I was doing a technology kid, uh, camp for high school kids. And I asked one of the kids, how much do you have to memorize things at school? And they said to me, we don't. I said, what do you mean? They said, we don't have to. We just need to know where and how to access that information when we need it. Okay? So what does that mean for all of you that are trainers? That means the way that we were doing things to have them do academic bulimia, which in my opinion is shove it in their heads, spew it back out on paper, they know it, we move on, is over. Those days are long gone. Now it's get it to me quick, short, and when I need it, and that's it. All right? And the reason why is I say this all the time. We get to work, uh, our company gets to work with a lot of sales um, divisions of larger businesses. They hate trainers. Salespeople hate us. I love you, but salespeople hate you, like with a passion, right? Well, if we can take some of that mentality to, to assume that everyone that's coming into the workplace is going to be a new salesperson, even if they're not, then maybe we can start changing our mode of thinking and just give them short spats of that, that information when needed. So the first thing that I want to ask you guys is what can we do to help ourselves? Well, I'm hoping with these next couple slides we can kind of shift our thinking in the way that we actually think about learning. And the first one, how many of you guys have kids? How many of you guys have kids, okay? How many of them play Call of Duty? A few of them, all right. I've yet to lose this, I've yet to lose this in the eight years that I've been doing this. Um, before I play this video, here's the thing. For you right here, all right, I got 20 bucks in my pocket to anyone in here that if you call your son or daughter right now and ask them what sniper rifle is best to use in an urban combat setting, they will answer you like this. You wanna know why? Because they learned in a game. But the problem is we don't consider it learning, do we? So I wanna show you a quick video, one of my favorite videos actually. Uh, if my mouse wants to play nice. Play. Play. There we go. Peggy 18. So this is Assassin's Creed, the game. For anyone that doesn't know this game, this is the one, this is Assassin's Creed 4. It's about the American Revolutionary War. And I'm just, this is just the preview of it. During this game, I went and threw the tea off the boat at the Boston Tea Party. I experienced the battles. I got to talk to the Native Americans. I got to be a Native American. And you know what it did to me? It pissed me off to know what we did to a Native Americans. It blows my mind. Now, where am I going with this? I have a K through 12 education. I have an associate's degree in IT networking. I have a bachelor's degree in digital design. I have an MBA and on my, my second year of my PhD in instructional design, I got absolutely not even near the education about the American Revolutionary War from any of my formal education than I did by experiencing it. So here's the one thing I can tell you. You don't learn until you experience it. How many of you have played this game? The next time your kids are playing Call of Duty, and I'll stop this for a second. The next time your kids are playing Call of Duty, ask them, why did you pick that gun? What did you learn from this game? How did you? Same thing with Assassin's Creed or any game. Sit down and ask them what they're learning about that game. Because kids are learning from this information and being immersed. You are immersed into that game. That's, what I, that's why I learned, not because I was told what it was like. Now, that's hard because a lot of the instructional design material that we do, right, is telling them. It's telling them. So we have to figure out uh, another way of approaching that. Uh, my son was 24 years ago when he was a teenager and playing a lot of these games. I asked him, I said, if you had to um, encounter some 
patrol in order to get across the bridge, you had to earn credits and then buy in the store um, the ability to speak with him in a different language, in his language. I said, would you do that? I said, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. And that, you know, the more activities you did, you get more credits and earn and learn more language to use with the troll. Very cool. And uh, I said, that's your Spanish class. It's just a cool way you're Spanish. And then another, you had to learn how to shoot a cannon over a wall to get to the other group. And you had to figure out the angles and calculate it. Yeah. Because to win, he said, yeah, I totally do that. That's geometry. That's, yeah. wow, yeah. The games could really be extremely powerful, much more than just a boring text. You're right, and I'm about to show you one a great example. Has anybody ever heard of Domino's Pizza Hero? Okay, so Domino's Pizza Hero is free in the App Store. You can go ahead and download it. Now, here's where it gets to be way more in-depth than what you ever thought it was. Domino's put this game out for free. Domino's makes you register. Domino's is looking for people aged 18 to 22. The top 5,000 people that got the top 5,000 scorers at Domino's between those ages were reached out to by Domino's for jobs. Guess what, trainers? Your job's over. And I will show you what it looks like. This so it blows your mind that your, your kids know how to make the Domino's pizzas, huh? Well, it all comes down to Domino's realized, why don't we front load the training and make it into a game? And then they said, we can hire these top performers of this and it cost us nothing because they're already trained. And that's all it is. So, just like I said before, learning is happening. We're not considering it learning at all. So maybe we need to rethink our mode of what learning actually is because it's happening inside of this environment and now domino saves a considerable amount of money by just having these kids learn and play the game ahead of time and compete against each other that then indirectly helps domino save money in onboarding that's how you can use gaming and learning to make it interesting now we're going to talk a little bit about motion tracking. That's been hot lately. How many of you guys have the Microsoft Connect? Your kids have the Connect. Do they play it? A little bit, a little bit. Not, not as much, right? Because you know what? This is what I say a lot. These technologies I'm showing you, I'm going to be showing you examples of them and how they really were applied to actual learning, OK? But there's also hype cycles to these things, all right? So do yourself a favor. If you're ever going to look at some of these technologies, look at the problem you have first. And, and not the technology, because it'll make life a lot easier for you, okay? So the first one I'm gonna show is, I actually have it with me, so if you guys wanna play with it, I'll bring it out during the lunch hour. Um, it's the Leap Motion device. And um, what happened is, we had a recycling company come to us and say, we would like to be able to see if people can be more effective at recycling when the things are coming down the conveyor belt. Now, to you, just instructional designers, wait a second, you're like, so you're telling me your trained employees don't know the difference between paper, plastic, aluminum, and waste, right? Yes, that's your problem. So instead of us just saying, how about we make like a mouse drag and drop thing so that we know you know it and just put it in the LMS, we decided why don't we actually have them experience it? So what we ended up doing for Recycle Roundup is taking the Leap Motion device and um, let it get past this real quick. The Leap Motion device and we actually built a game in the Leap Motion, for all of you that don't know, it's just a small little bar that you set in front of your computer and it tracks your hand movements. So you can do things with your hands. So what you're about to see here is we had a waste company come to us and want to be trained. We had that, they had that problem, we're recycling. So we built with the Leap Motion, Recycle Roundup. Your job is to literally try to see how effective you are at sorting. And that was the problem that they had. So we wheeled this game in to them, sat down with them. Now, instructional designers, don't we start with the objectives and we start them slow, then we get them increase, right? So here's your starting them slow, okay, with the leap motion device. Three, two, one, go, because that's how that conveyor belt really runs. Let's see how effective they are now. 
And then it continues. And you can use both hands when doing this. So this is an example of how you can use a motion tracking device to put on something for learning that doesn't necessarily have to be something you've seen before. It's just an application of how you can do it. Has anybody seen the Leap Motion device? I'll get it out right after this. I'll plug it in and you guys can come wave your hand on it, okay? It's really fun. So this is just showing you the example. Um, and I'll have this, I'll set it up, you guys can play with it, okay? Um, oops. My, our goal for the game was to increase the identification and the sorting ability by the actual in-house recycle employees that do nothing but that sorting. So we wanted to make it a fun, engaging game without just making it literal, okay? And we wanted to be immersed in it, but we didn't want to just do a drag and drop type of thing on a computer. We wanted them to be a little bit more immersed than that. I keep hitting the wrong button, I think. And yet, um, because we saw the stuff go by, assuming Yeah, nothing on the conveyor belt. And you get points off if you don't. Yeah, if things fall off the conveyor belt. Um, this one, I want to show you, for all of you that have Microsoft Connects, um, we were commissioned by the National Institute of Health to build OT Island, Occupational Therapist Virtual Assistant. This we now have in uh, 7,000 hospitals throughout the United States. And what this is, it's in the physical therapy department. It's a, it's a tower type of system with the connect, connected to it with a big screen TV and a computer. And basically, we take you through the six axes of motion to relearn how to use your arms after you've been a stroke victim. Did I mention that you so this, this development was funded by the National Institute of Health because they were having problems with, with trying to do all the occupational therapy through the hospitals. For all of you, anybody work in healthcare? You know, what are they doing with hospital physical therapy now? They're outsourcing it because they can't handle the volume of what they have to do. So there's virtual occupational assistance for all of you that have used the Connect. This is what it's recording. That's Greg sitting in the chair, one of our uh, lead gamification specialists. And whatever he's doing, it's mimicking on the screen. Now, the reason why we're doing this is if you have a stroke or something wrong with your arm, you can't make food. You can't feed yourself. We want to be able to get you to the point where you can do that again. So we want to be able to have you help practice that. Now, there's over 30 different games that are built in here. Everything from your ability to pull levers to keep the air balloons going. You got to like go like this and go around air balloons. We built uh, 30 different games. So this is just one out of the other 29 games that have been built into this. And then Virtual Occupational Therapy, VOTA, gets rolled in. At the physical therapy places, the, the patient gets to choose which game they want to go and play, and bam. Now, the there's detailed, um, for all of you that are going, well, what about your, your analytical data? We're tracking Please all of their analytical data the and then comparing it to every single day. Done with the spatula. Please put it in so the now spatula. all of a sudden, we have all the comparable data of how they move their arm in every Just session. From the grocery store. And then we can compare that to see way. if the next time they did that, it was more efficient with their arm. Because your arm has six degrees of motion. And we're tracking all six. We have two connects set up. So it's getting all the mo uh, degrees of motion. So what you're looking at here is one of the others where you're doing the baskets. And you're putting away your groceries. Now, for some of you, this seems a little boring, right? But if you can't put your groceries away, what a thrill. Way to go. To be able to do something you used to be able to do before. And it's all done with the connect and a gaming engine and a database. And it's a way that you can actually adapt and utilize the motion tracking material, okay? Now for some of you are like, well, I work in the automobile industry, making an engine, not a kitchen. Way to go. I work in the um, telecommunications industry, making a network switch system. That's what we did with HP, the same type of thing. So you can use these devices currently. I'm gonna show you some really cool examples here. Uh, virtual touch screens. How many of you guys have messed with virtual touch screens before? Anybody seen any of the virtual? I love these things. Like, I'm literally so excited about getting one of these. Anybody saw, anybody witnessed this one? Have you guys ever? Yeah. These are used by the military all the time. These are augmented reality tables. Now, they're filled with sand. 
So what you don't know is there's actual sand on the screen or on the table. And when they move that sand, the augmented reality system realizes that that went lower and then will do whatever action that's happening. So what you're seeing is they're filling up the tank here. He's going to go like this and swipe it, and that water's just going to run as if it were real life. And this is all done. And for all of you like, oh my gosh, how are they doing this? It's just a projector above their head. Has anybody been to like an, uh, a child? I have a two-year-old, so we like do all the child things now. And have you ever been to like the virtual or like uh, at a play place where they have like the soccer on the ground, but it's projected down onto the ground and they like yeah. kick the soccer ball? Yeah the, fish and the fish. yeah, the fish and you can like, yeah. It's the same system. It's just a projector reading that analytical data. Now this one is my favorite because this um, I just got to see at a futurist conference. This is what we're going to be faced with in the future. This is being projected on the screen. You don't have to wear special glasses. That entire 3D space. And here we're starting to represent a basketball game, or a future basketball game. Now watch this. I'm taking now the role of the technical expert or the um, expert pundit. What I might want to do is get rid of that stadium so we can really see close up how these players are going to line up. I have set plays here, so I can click on here to see how particular ways they're going to play. I can drag my players around and move them in different positions. So, I'm, so I know Two projectors, that's guy. it. I know he likes to shoot from distance, so... If I click him here, he's going to take a shot. He never miss, misses. He always gets that in. So because he's going to be shooting from distance, our man here needs to track him. So I'll I just saw this, and position. I know it's a really crappy Before video. I could That's what I get for using my iPhone. Them. But I knew that I would be doing this do meeting, and I went to the Futurist Conference, so and I walked by this, and I think I peed right. my pants a little, <laughs> and then turned around <laughs> and was like, I got to get this. Play. Move them to right? Position this is our future. I'm interested in this guy okay? Here, now, uh, where does that go with learning? Think about all those times you've wanted to be able to do so training do where they're actually in a space, but you haven't been able to do it. And go back into the real, into the real environment. So various different moves that I can do. So now this one is very, very hot right now. Um, virtual reality. How many of you guys have heard like the HTC Hive or the Oculus Rift? Anybody got to play with them yet? Oh my gosh, okay, have you? Isn't it unbelievable? Okay, so this was an, I wish I would have had this video and I will literally bring this in there, into this. But I watched Brain Games. Anybody saw the TV show Brain Games? They did an experiment with virtual reality where they had you lay down as a person and you only looked at your body. And in the, with the augmented reality system, they had a guy come up and cut your fake arm off. First thing people did, whoa, flinched because you use your eyes before you use any other senses. Your eyes dominate all of your senses. Okay, yeah. I have a friend who works for Oculus Rift and there's a um, T-Rex demo. Yeah. And without fail, and it like comes down the hall and it comes up and like growls at you in your face. And without fail, everybody wipes their face off. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's proven that you use your, your eyes as the first sense than anything else. And so, utilizing a virtual reality headset, if you watch the brain games, and I promise I'll, I'll get you guys the brain game video, but basically that TV show, that's what they did, is they put an augmented reality and cut the arm off and everybody freaked out. It's because it's the first thing that we use. That's why virtual reality is becoming so popular because it's nailing the primary sense that we use at all times as a way for us to be immersed in an environment. I'm gonna show you some really cool examples here. Um, the first one is the coral reef example. Uh, has anybody seen the immersive coral Virtual reef example? Is where you can put on uh, apparatus. I mean, basically, it's it's goggles. And, and so this is actually um, using um, the Oculus, or actually the HTC Hive on this one, um, where you're actually going to go into the coral reef and swim around the coral reef. There's a problem with that right now. Your eye will travel around, and you'll see something, and suddenly you are immersed. In another world. So I show you this because number one, coral reefs are dying at an immense rate. Number two, when you swim around a coral reef, you can't get this close to the reef because you can't put your feet down, so on and so forth. 
So now all of a sudden, you can immerse yourself in a coral reef as if you were scuba diving or snorkeling in Jamaica without leaving your living room. And just like I told you before, our main sense that we use is our eyes. So it's going to have you feel as if you're immersed in this experience. So we'll let this go. And while this is playing, a stunning 360 degree view of the reef as I guide you ever deeper. This is free, by the way, for all of you. How many of you guys have a Samsung phone? Yeah? Do you know there's a VR Samsung app? And then you can literally open this coral reef and just do it. For all of you like, woo! And another thing, if you want to do this on the cheap, use your phones and uh, purchase Google Cardboard for $3.99. Not $399, $3.99. And your phone slides right in there with that app and it gives you an immersive experience with spending little to no money. So I'll show you another example. This is actually the HTC. Hi. Anybody heard of Job Simulator? This, this as instructional designers, I feel, is like the coolest, the funniest thing ever. HTC Hive came out with a game on their, uh, in, uh, their, their devices, their virtual reality devices, called Job Simulator. You can simulate six or seven different jobs in this virtual environment. And so all of us should look at this. Now, um, this was a, a video I got off of YouTube, and a girl so is just playing, so don't let it get you sick, okay? So she's grabbing, she's already been a chef, a mechanic. And I have played the store clerk. But I have not actually played uh, the new office worker. So that's her down in the bottom right. You're watching her. And this is what she sees. First thing I want to do is take a look. At, oh, what the hell? Did somebody spit their gum on the floor? Oh, God, why can I pick this up? Everything looks pretty close to how it was in the... Uh, in the, the demo, you don't need that. I think we'd get in trouble if I threw my oh, clock on the other side of the cubicle. Job. Are you guys ready to job work assignment? Get to work. Start their day with an addictive All right, what are we stimulus. doing? Oh, wait, I've already done this before. I can't say no. <laughs> All right. Oh, there's one. Wait, he's appearing? Oh my god, why can't this happen in real life? All right, new work assignment. What do we got? Now you're ready to start your day. The computer is the most important facet of the office. Don't have to tell me. So if you can do it in real life, you can do it in this virtual environment. Let's do this. All right, password. Ma, 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 ma. All right, I check my email. Okay, let's see. I got a lot of messages. That's what oh, I want. That's what I want in my game. Email. Oh, enlarge your hard drive. Okay, I read. I read that really quickly. All right. Well, you know what? You know what? Let's just. Let's just. <laughs> Yay! I don't know about you guys, but everything I see her doing, I wish I was doing. I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah. She's not the most appropriate person, and I apologize. Okay. Okay. But what this does show us is that you actually have the ability to do okay. anything. If they can do right, you sitting at your cubicle, you can do it for any job role. Whether this is, we had to do one like this, but it wasn't in virtual environment. Uh, cooking books, acquiring cheese, and driving cars. All right, so far, I kind of like him. What else we got here? Hipster bot, safari bot, he sounds cool. All right, I'll pause uh, this. Navigation. He's pretty good with because I don't know about you, but I watched this for like an hour. <laughs> she just keeps going and going. And the reason why I wanted to show this video is not because she was being inappropriate, but because if you can simulate you sitting at a cubicle, we can simulate or immerse ourselves into any environment. Good example is we had Comcast come to us a couple years ago. They were having problems with supervisory uh, managers at their call centers being jerks at work. So we built an immersive experience like this where you're in your office and supervisory managers interact with you and you have to you know, be bureaucratic or so on and so forth. So even though soft skills and things like that can be done in this immersive environment, it's better for them to do it in this immersive environment and safe than to call the CEO a jerk or to throw the clock on the other side of the cubicle. The next one we're going to see, biometrics. Biometrics. How many of you guys have the biometric reader on your, on your computer? Any of you? I love that thing. 
And now with Windows 10, oh, you guys got Macs. OK, so Windows 10, now they have the biometric thing built into it so much. So you gotta give that weird look just to get into your. Oh, that's awesome. We, the ones that we have, we have two Dell touch screens that we take to the conferences, and I did that same stupid thing where I was like this. So if you guys ever see me at one of the larger conferences at the exhibitors booth setting up, you'll see me over the computers doing this, because it's got to get like my forehead like here to work. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about who's using biometrics and how is it being used with augmented reality and how might we be able to use that ourselves. Biometrics is defined as the measurement of unique physical or behavioral characteristics as a means of verifying personal now, identity. Now, this is actually from the NFL. Is this okay. Capture of physiological data. Capturing that data really gives you an objective point of view of their biological abilities throughout the course of time in order so we can get the most out of our athletes and help the athletes get the most out of themselves. For many years, we've been undertaking the science behind personalized nutrition. What we have now reached is really the coming together of that science, but with technology innovation. This is NFL Next. So in each one of the, um, you're going to see, like the Jacksonville Jaguars. Catapult Technologies was one you guys of the first companies Catapult? to use scientific data to help train and coach players. They call it scientific performance management. Every single one of the equipment, the jerseys, everything for the Jacksonville Jaguars is all integrated with Catapult. They can tell you how fast, where you were, what you did, how you felt. How you reacted, uh, how quickly you reacted. It's on a player at practice will give us information on uh, their velocity traveled, and then more specifically, especially for our running guys, how much distance they traveled running at high speeds. So for all of you, like, how is this applicable? Each, day, um, each athlete, they'll have probably... How many of you guys... I'm going to pause this. Down 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 this pause. So over the course of... Uh, how many of you guys have ever had to take CPR training? What if, during that CPR training, we could actually track how efficient you were at the, at the pumps. Rather than, remember, because you know what happened. They said, do that 15 times, and then blow into their mouth. And then you had the one girl was doing this, and then the one guy's like, <laughs> right? Like literally going to kill him. OK? What if we could actually determine if you're doing it efficiently or not through biometrics and, and measurement, rather than just, this is what you're told to do. Here's a plastic dummy. We're not reading any of that data. Is yeah. haptics the same as biometrics? Yeah. yeah. It's a, we can talk about it afterwards, but you, it, it all falls into that same category. Yeah, you're correct. Um, the next one I wanted to show for the biometrics and uh, augmented reality um, is one that I really like. It wants to play nice. Play. Have, have you guys watched this? OK. So this was originally made over gamification, right? This got really big in 2013, 2014, this video. I brought it into this because I feel like it's a little bit more about augmented reality and data overlay in which I feel we're gonna see within our generation, within our lifetime. So I don't think we're gonna have Google glasses. I think we'll end up with augmented reality glasses or even augmented reality contact lenses is what I think we'll end up with. Now, just so you know, this is made up. It's not real. So, but this is what you'll see. When you come home and your kids are playing Call of Duty, well done. they're just going to be walking around going, that's what it's going to look like. That's the future. I've yet to feel like that after a race car game or an airplane game. Just putting that out there. You now see smart fridges, right? You guys see, uh, have you witnessed like GE came out with a smart fridge and it'll tell you what you're low on and then add it to your grocery list and then throw it to your app? Eventually you're gonna have all that material in your eyes, so what's the point in even putting it onto the device? Little Fruit Ninja. It's still there. 
It's still, it's still, it's still there. I, I don't know what they're doing with it right now, but it's still there. Um, the next one I want to talk about because I have this conversation a lot. Um, I feel like we're bombarded with information, but we have problems with communication. And this is a great technology for all of you that have kids because we're going to be faced with that more and more as we evolve as a species. So I'm going to show you this. Um, one of the things you should know is you know, children born into the computer generation are tech savvy, but they've lost their ability to communicate effectively. Okay? Um, you could probably see this if you ever tried to talk to one of your teenage kids while they're on their phone. We know it doesn't work. So I want to show you a little thing called Povey. Povey is a nice cuddly animal. Um, this is currently for sale, so that you guys know. This is an entire robotic platform that connects parents to a network of child development specialists. Child development uses robot through a plush toy in an app to direct expert knowledge towards teaching young kids emotional intelligence. Povey creates context for thoughtful, imaginative conversations between you and your child. Stories are written and curated by expert psychologists, parents, and teachers to spark your child's imagination. Who <laughs> said distance learning? Yeah, it is. But it's also something. Today's environment is taking a toll on the social emotional development of young kids. We experience busy parents overwhelmed by responsibilities and hyper digital kids consumed by their devices. And our team understands this and aims to help parents and kids have more human interactions that develop social emotional skills. Povey's job is to help parents build up to So I'll pause there. And the reason, no, 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 don't, ah, no. Hit the wrong button. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. I'm cool with that. Make sure it's me. <laughs> no, um, I wanted to show you the Povey thing because I feel as if, um, as a society, um, we're bombarded by that information, but we lack the ability to really disseminate that information, and we lack the ability to communicate effectively. So. By seeing this, I hope that we see that we have to, we're going to have to balance ourselves, or otherwise Povey will end up our, our communication device between our child and us, and that shouldn't be the case. And I only state that because I, I don't think it has anything to do with parent, your, you as a parent. I think it's a societal thing, where we're bombarded by all this information. Here's a great example. I was talking to somebody last night, and uh, this lady is here. I was at the, the restaurant. I got here at like 9 o'clock last night, so I quickly ate there. And I was talking to this lady, and she said, you know what was something that was magnificent for me? She was at the Santa Monica Pier the day before taking a picture of um, the sunset. She said that every single person was there taking a picture with, of the sunset with their phone. Once they took the picture, they went straight down to their phone and looked at their phone and interacted and waited for likes. Rather than enjoying the actual sunset. That's where we are as a society, okay? It has nothing to do with you or you or you. It's us as a society. Bombarded by information, we don't know how to disseminate it, and we don't know how to communicate. I just, I just have to add my story. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I, I was in Paris at the Louvre looking at the Mona Lisa. I was the only one actually looking at it. Everybody else was taking a picture, taking huh? a picture of themselves. They were either taking a picture of that or getting a selfie with the Mona Lisa behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the information. It's not about the experience yeah. anymore. Yeah, very scary. It is. Um, yeah, they are. I love watching it, seeing two people on a date. Yeah, oh yeah. Meet the world's first robotic kitchen. This is going to be my future. Equipped with two fully So you guys know this is fully operational now. This is not the future. It's Here, it's making CNBC a craft bisque. How does I it can... work? 
deal with Mummy this. Mummy Robotics invited MasterChef winner Tim Anderson in a special studio fitted with 3D cameras. So you see what they did? They recorded with motion tracking. The hop up or down. All those processes. The robot now replicates his movements. However, at $75,000, the first models will not come cheap. For all of you going $75,000, Every two years, um, technology doubles. Eight to ten years from now, there's your future okay, of your kitchen. Okay, so that's crab bisque with truffle oil. Let's have a little taste. So if it cuts in half every single, every two years, ten years from now, we're all going to have these in our, it's really our nice. kitchens. Okay, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> so mm. remember, I said this before. I said I'm not taking when we build technology that takes over a job role. We should be looking at trying to train those people in a different job role rather than just saying this robot took over my job because it's very true. Humans, robots won't do anything without the humans. They had to record the information and data first, right, before they could actually replicate that. And then technically, even with artificial intelligence where we are and even within the next 10 years, it can only basically replicate what we tell it to do. It does not have any critical thinking skills, okay? Now, for all of you that have iPads, have you heard of this technology? Sony came out with a new well, my name is Giovanni Mancini. I'm the director flexible, of digital, writable like piece of paper. A product that we introduced last week. This is called an e-ink Mobius display. What's great about Mobius is that it's an extremely lightweight and flexible product. As you can see, I have a 13.3 inch device over here that I can flex. Now, you would never look, actually to build a device that you want to do this. The reason why this is important is that as you try to build larger reading devices, having a glass uh, substrate will cause the device to become extremely heavy. With an e-ink Mobius display, this is roughly the size of an A4 sheet of paper, and it weighs only 63 grams. So the device is actually light and rugged. As you can see, I can drop this on the floor and nothing will happen to the device. It basically floats like a sheet of paper. The first product to actually use this is um, a product from Sony called the Digital Paper Prototype. So what I have here, as you can see, is a device that is uh, about the size of a sheet of paper. It, um, it is extremely light. and. Unlike a typical e-reader e -reader product that just would allow you to read books, this product actually allows you to read documents. So you can use it for education purposes, you could use it for business purposes, you could actually use it for industrial purposes. When Sony came out with this, um, oh, we'll pause. When Sony came out with that, um, they made a promise by 2025 that they would replace paper with those. So Sony is attempting to replace paper completely. And the reason why is they realize that they can reuse uh, a lot of recycled plastics to make it. And it's a flexible digital screen, which exists now. So they're just waiting until the technology comes down to be affordable as paper. That's the only thing holding that back right now. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is mobile hardware. We are faced with this right now. I know one person in this room that already has an Apple Watch on them, but has their phone on them within a three foot radius. Right? So it doesn't necessarily mean it's about the phone. It's about the actual hardware device and what type of affordances that hardware device can give to me. OK? How do you, what, what, what do you do with your Apple phone? Or with your, with your um, Apple Watch? We track uh, apps. Yeah. Phone calls. Yeah. Well, I only, I'm asking not as in like, what do you do with it, but more like, <laughs> at least you're honest <laughs> at least you're honest well the reason why I bring this up is because we're now bombarded by hardware devices and if you guys look on eBay right now you literally can get a knockoff of an Apple watch for like 30 bucks okay so that means that technology is there all right it's doing heart rate monitors it's doing uh, it's pedometers uh, so on and so forth. So as those technologies continue to evolve, we're going to be faced with the fact that we're going to have to build and develop content that can be put onto those phones and to those devices. What I think is so archaic in my life is that I have to carry this thing around in my pocket. Th that is archaic in my opinion. So much power in this device, 
yet it goes in my pocket at all times. And now right? we have to carry the battery charger yeah. in the other pocket to get this through our keynote speaker at the conference. You mean this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the same, look, Weasel's doing the same thing, right? It, it's archaic. It's archaic. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a huge adaptation within this in the first, uh, within the next We've five been using years. Our computers like this I'm going to show you some of these that are now out, that this have been launched, right and now are ready to be released to the and public. Computers don't look like because this I think anymore. these are things that you guys should at least know about. They look like this. Have you ever or seen this? Just a keyboard and mouse don't make sense anymore. It's time to get your hands dirty with Just. That's your keyboard, people. Just lets you control your computer with your hands. For example, Photoshop. Adjust the contrast. Oop, a little less. OK. Now the brightness. Yep, perfect. Save that. Let's take this a little further. Add a logo. Bring it down, lower, a little to the right. Great. If you have two of them, you can even type. So what's this mean? Get we ready for gloves, people. Every accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer, and pass it through advanced motion processing. Sometimes your friends can get annoying. A quick hand gesture takes care of that. Just connects to your iOS or Android device, so you can connect it to almost anything, like your lights and your music. So this literally is going to replace your keyboard and your mouse. But I show you this not to be like, hey, look at this cool new technology. I look at this because this is what we're going to be facing as instructional designers and facing how are we going to educate the people that are walking around with these, right? They're no longer going to be clicking on our, our assessment questions, okay? We have to be able to figure that out. I don't have all the answers. If I had all the answers, I would be making millions sitting on that beach over there and you, I'd be like, Nice to see you guys have a conference going on. But that's not the case. I don't have the answers. But what I do know is kind of where we're going to be headed with this as a society as a whole. And I'll get to that in a second. But I want to show a couple more that are out that are not the same technology, but allow us to understand what we're up against. If you want to enhance your style in the gym, try Athos. Their wearable tech measures biometrics and sends the info to an app. How many so of you guys like um, yoga pants? Hasn't even seen their product yeah. Yet, you're about to. <laughs> yoga pants. Now you can get yoga pants that will track everything that you do, how effective you were at working out. Say goodbye to your personal trainer because in the future, wearables will be doing their job instead. We met up with Jake Waxenberg from Athos, a company who created a system that measures your performance and fitness when you're working out. So tell me a little bit about How can this be applied to real world situations? What if we could sit in a room where it was an uncomfortable conversation with our employee and determine on afterwards if they were emotionally intelligent or at the level that they need to be? You could rate that information and data. Asking them honest questions. How happy are you at your job? Because you know what they're going to say. What you're seeing here. I, I love my job. My regular gear then they go back to their coworkers. I hate this place. I was ready to do some squats. Right? All right, so what we're seeing here during Bradley's squat is his muscle effort. Now, these are, are out. So these are products that are out. I'm not giving you something five years from now. These are what's out today that we are going to be faced with within five years. These are the things that we have to figure out how to utilize in our training. That's exactly what he needs to change. So as we see, when I was looking at you, it looked like you're going down perfectly straight, just past 90 degrees, look like great form. But what we see in the app from your actual muscle effort and activity is that you use the left side a lot more than that right side, and even a little bit on the glute. And this just gives you a window into your muscles to see what's actually going on. Athos has created so, a I want to pause it there. system able to measure pause, everything from muscle exertion to heart rate and give feedback on par with what you might find at elite sports performance institutes. Don't start over. Your style in the gym. Try Athos. They're wearable. Here's the next one. And hopefully it won't autoplay. The reason why I wanted to show you Athos is because if you can utilize readable device information, the one thing that I can tell you is I hear this all the time, is how do I see my measurable results, right? If you can use devices to do that, those tools. Don't we use a device to do that now, our LMS? 
and it's really crappy because most of us are only using SCORM, so we only know that they pass it and what score they got, and that's it, right? But we're supposed to show all these measurable results in training. How can you if we don't have the measurable result tools to do so? So hopefully some of these technologies can help with that. The VUFINE. You asked about the Google Glasses. The reason why I hesitated is because, first off, I love Google. I have been interested but second, in global technology for here's the answer now. to that. I mean, who hasn't? I have tried just about every smart glass there is. And the smart glass effort has been so unfocused, overpriced, impractical, and overcomplicated. I wanted to create something that is simple, useful, and affordable that works with the technology you already have. I'm Goro Kosaka, CEO and founder of Viewfine. And this, this is Viewfine. The reason why they didn't apply is with well, too big of a price we point. to do something different. Specific hardware you know, only for their device. Smart have some device. fundamental issues from privacy to basic functionality. And really it seemed to us that people already had the functionality they were looking for with their current technology. People don't need another smartphone on their face. We carry so much technology with us every day, and it's only getting more powerful. Why not place that utility somewhere where you really want it? Viewfind is a high-definition clip-on display that can connect to anything with an HDMI output. Your smartphone, tablet, laptop, GoPro, drone, and much more. We've gone to great lengths to keep Viewfind as simple as possible. It has one button and two ports. It has no internal operating system requiring proprietary applications. It can attach to a wide variety of user glasses using an incredibly stable magnetic docking station that allows Viewfind to be both easily adjustable and easy to put on and take off. And those are only consumer applications. Viewfind's utility in the workplace is equally diverse with potential across countless fields. And because Viewfind is so streamlined, the possibilities for its use are virtually endless. With Viewfind, product value is user generated because instead of dictating use, it facilitates it. With Viewfind, users can easily interface with crucial information while staying hands-free. Use it as a viewfinder for your GoPro to make sure you're capturing exactly what you want to capture. Use it as a convenient at-a-glance GPS or a way to watch videos privately on a crowded train. Use Viewfind as a rear view camera for your motorcycle or bicycle or simply to display fitness goals. How many of you guys have to do on-the-job training? That's your answer. Rather than you saying, hey, come off the factory for a second and let me train you how to do this. It's throw that viewfinder right in front of them. And then not only that, you can record it and see how effective they are. And then you trainers can then turn around and look at that and say, look, you didn't do this step, this step, and this step right when I was looking back at your, your uh, attempt. Rather than what we do now, which is, you didn't do the attempt right. Well, what did you do wrong? We don't know, but you didn't do it right. So all I'm stating is this technology is going to give us the affordance to be able to measure the way we want to measure as trainers. That's what this stuff is going to do for us. Now, this one is my favorite. Um, Secrete bracelet. Um, everybody, uh, well, not everybody, but many of you probably saw this as like a viral video on YouTube because it went over Facebook and YouTube everywhere. They got full funding. They got full funding. I, because I said, we're doing this archaic thing with our phones. That got full funding. It's now in production. When they did their Kickstart campaign. Yeah. Order it, right? Didn't you get mad? I did too. I was like, where is this thing? Why can't I have this right now? Their Kickstarter got fully funded. They got uh, full manufacturing rights. They're in manufacturing right now. Production. Just imagine what this is going to do. Now I don't have this archaic thing in my hand. I have it on my wrist and maybe here. Look like you're whipping a nae nae in. Anybody witnessed this before? Have you seen this video on like Facebook before? No? This is where we're headed. 
this is what your phones will be. Does it change what we're doing with mobile learning and things? No, but it's gonna make them easier for them to be able to access this data and information. Yeah. It has built-in sound and um, audio. Um, well, I was just about to pull something out, but I don't know what I did with it. I have a Bluetooth headset that looks like a um, that looks like a hearing aid. I hope I didn't leave it over there. Um, that's what I use the majority of the time for privacy. First off, I don't look like that guy with the. And second off, it's small and a hearing aid and gives me as much privacy as possible. Yep. Right now, looking at their first version, they'll have Bluetooth integration, um, a mic, um, a camera, um, the projector system, and um, obviously a lithium battery. So I stated it because everything I'm showing you here is not stuff that we're gonna see 10 years from now. It's what is being produced right now that is gonna hit the market and that we're gonna be faced with as trainers. So do you remember I made a comment at the beginning of this about um, the average span of a millennial's attention, right? So you're in a, <laughs> three seconds. Uh, I forgot, what am I talking about again? Oh, sorry. Um, well, the thing that I wanted you to know is you guys have already heard like micro learning has become really, really big, right? And everybody's doing micro learning, da, 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 da. The reason why is it's not about this new fad of micro learning. It's about the fact that our brains have shifted to being able to sit there for 20 minutes and, and watch something. That's not how it is anymore. So micro learning is becoming very popular only because the attention spans are very, very low. Now, what does that do for instructional designers? I was born and raised in a generation where as instructional designers, we put our learning objectives at the beginning for the entire learning experience, right? Now in micro learning, what we have to do is break those all apart and give you little chapters of each section Right? So it's all still there for you instructional designers. But rather than thinking about it as a 30 minute course, you're thinking about it as 10 courses with only just a minute or two each. Does this make sense? It's a series of YouTube videos. Yeah, basically a series of YouTube videos. You know, if you thought, you, you said that, that's the best way to think about it, okay? Because if I'm watching YouTube, you get me for 30 seconds, even on an interesting YouTube video. If you notice I stop these, these videos, there's enough, found, there's a, 100% reason why I stop these in the middle of it is because I'll start losing your attention if I just let it play. But if I stop it and continue to talk to you, I, I got your attention. Then I bring you back to a video, don't I? And then I come back and I cut it off early because I know that your attention spans are like this. And especially if you have a phone or a device in front of you. Yeah, it's exactly. like this. That's about all I build anymore. But the thing is, from an instructional design standpoint, it's hard at the beginning because you want to do, like you're, you're faced with solving this learning problem. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I gotta do this to it all? It's almost like the difference between building one pie and building 45 really tiny pies. Mm -hmm. It's more work. You're gonna be able to feed more people easier, but at the fact of the matter is it's still more upfront work for you. So I think um, you're gonna see micro learning become the standard. So all of a sudden it won't be called micro learning. It'll be called e-learning, <laughs> okay? Like, it's micro learning today, it's not tomorrow. Tomorrow it's just gonna be called e-learning. You're also gonna see that um, with the workforce coming in, they've been bombarded by a lot of this game-based material, instant gratification, things like that. The one thing that I always ask instructional designers, especially if you like, um, if what I consider you, okay, so let me back up, instructional designers, I have a big heart for you guys, not because I work in this industry, but because of two things. Number one, I always know that you have the smallest budgets than any other department. And number two, most of you are like a one woman, one man show trying to train all of these people on it. And it's very overbearing and hard to do. But yet salesperson asks for one thing and they get anything they want, right? So I have a big heart for that. And the reason why I tell you that is because micro learning and things like that, I think you guys can do and you're on your own. And even with the gaming stuff, this is what I tell people. Rather than doing a drag and drop to the answers, you know, the questions to the answers, make a little mini maze out of it, okay? And then just see how effective that mini maze was for that assessment question, okay? 
And as you go, the next course you make, make a maze and then maybe make some type of balloon popping thing. And just slowly start integrating some of that stuff in, okay? Be a little bit more creative with your assessment pieces and you'll start to see some of the millennials catching on a little bit more of that because they've been bombarded by games and data and, and this stuff and technology that a lot of times for us it's easy to make a, a drag and drop question to answer thing. But our brains work much differently than theirs. And this is what I tell people. In the past, and I said this about K through 12, in the past we had to know this information and retain that information. That isn't the case anymore. Now it's just tell me where it is and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and get it when I need it. Otherwise, I just need to know where it is, not do I need to know it. And I think I'm running out of time. Um, other thing that you guys are doing right now, um, custom learning pass. As soon as I say that, everybody's like <laughs> And then there's always one that leaves. Um, <laughs> every time, as soon as I say, we're almost done. <laughs> I'm like, OK. Um, the other thing is custom learning pass. I talked about this before. And what I mean by custom learning pass is uh, Lisa from Nielsen's in the room, and they do a great job with the custom learning pass and the my learning material. Um, they look at it from a, a holistic standpoint of not just, we're going to make this custom learning path because you're having problems with um, insubordination, but actual custom learning path from the beginning to the end of their working environment of that job role and the working environment of that, of that life expectancy of that employee. Okay? We have to do that a lot more because right now we used to do make a module, everybody will take it, right? And then all of a sudden we get violations because they didn't, they didn't pay attention to the module and then all of a sudden we're getting violations. And then guess what happens? The chief learning officer comes to you and says, well, you know, I was talking to the HR people. We got a lot of violations. I thought you did a module on that. Like I did, but I mass produced it for the masses rather than making it a custom path based around them. For instance, the ethical situations that people are in sales are much different than somebody in HR. HR has to deal with People like maternity leave, paternity leave, insubordination, issues with other employees, so on and so forth. Their emotional intelligence training should be so different than the salespeople. But that's not what we do, do we? We do emotional intelligence for everybody in the office, right? That's the difference of what we have to shift to change. And the next thing is, here's what I tell people. With technology, I don't expect you to be an early adopter, okay? You don't have to be. Usually the early adopters are people that waste their money anyways, okay? Because let's be honest, they, build, they buy the first one. The first one isn't fully ready to go unless it's an Apple product. And then it gets launched and there's all these bugs and then we go, crap, I wish I wouldn't have bought this. And then the second one comes out and we're like, whoa, this is way better. Look at the Kinect versus the Kinect 2. You know, look at all the other devices and things that we've bought. So you don't have to be an early adopter, but what you have to be able to do is embrace it. What I mean by that is the next time your kids want to buy a technology device, ask them why. And not the parental, well, why do you want to buy that? No, ask them what is it that makes you want to have that and what are you going to do with it? Why are you going to use this and what value is that going to be placed upon you as a person? And ask them that question. Second thing is, if you want to get into that stuff like I was talking about with the drag and drop and maze stuff, download games, even if it's Candy Crush. Download and play those. It'll help you get more immersed into how to do some of those interactions other than the default interactions we're used to. Multiple choice, drag and drop, true and false. You know? And I'm not saying you have to build full games. We don't have to do that at that point. Okay? We're, we're at a, a realm where instructional designers, you have limited resources. You should just try to figure out ways to adapt some of that. We don't have to go all the way out and hire a vendor to go build a game. Now, I say that because that's what we do, but I'm saying as one man and women shows, don't do that, okay? Focus on just small micro-learning and a little bit of adaptation as you go. And then um, what can actually help motivate some of these employees? Because you're always going to have the naysayers that don't want to adapt to the technology. How many of you guys have those people in your office, right? How many of you have the one person that still yet has ever logged into the LMS? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So here are some ways you can actually em embrace that, right? Sharing and collaboration. One of the things that we'll do is we'll talk about a course that we've had to take with the whole group, and then you'll find out who really didn't do it. 
because you're sharing information about that course, and then they go, crap, I really wish I would have paid, went ahead and taken that. The other side of it, give a better view of an individual performance. That's the hard part with our LMSs right now, right? We can't, we can't do that. So there has to be a way for you to be able to do that as benchmarks outside of it, okay? Whether that means having in-class training, which I'm not a big fan of, but at the same time, in-class training or any type of measurable results that you can give them personalized to exactly what you want to see them do. You do this with performance evaluations all the time, right? But how many times do you guys go back and look at the performance evaluations to help them throughout the year? You do? How often do you go back and review the performance evaluations and then build your training around the lack of performance from the employees? Of our own team, or you just mean the population in general? Uh, your own team. Do you do it? Yeah. I do you? But then I don't, I, my team's not like 100 people. Right. It's easier for me. Well, that's awesome that you're doing it because, because a lot of times it just seems very overwhelming because it's a ton of people, but what you'll find is, I don't know if you saw this, but you probably saw patterns in that performance material, and those patterns are not normally, like you'll see an anomaly of an employee that's just poor performing, but 95% of the time what you see is patterns in which data was not disseminated in a way for them to understand it. Maybe they're violating the, the lunch break rule, yeah. right? Boom, 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 boom. Well, that's how you find out what more problems that you have, is you can look at those performance evaluations and find out exactly where the performance is lacking. And then rather than saying, well, you employee have a problem with your performance. No, you have to turn around and say, maybe we didn't give you the information that we needed to, to ensure that that performance increases. And then last but not least, um, make sure you have a strategic plan. If you're gonna integrate any of these new technologies, don't talk about the technology. Okay, talk about your problem, okay? The technology should not be adapted for technology's sakes. It should be adapted to solve a problem. And if it doesn't solve the problem within the first month, scrap it, okay? Because I know how we are. We like adapt the technology. We're like, oh, I was the one that was the champion behind us integrating this technology. I'm going to force this down the throat until we die. But the problem is, if, we, if it doesn't fit into your culture, that's okay. That's what experimental learning is supposed to be. So the next time this happens, say, well, this was an experimental learning experience. And then everybody goes, oh, okay, we're good. Okay. All right. So try that. It might actually help. It might actually help. Look at it as an experimental learning experience rather than saying, we're going to do this, and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to use this technology, next technology, and we're going to run with it. Because nine times out of ten, you find that there's hiccups in every single one of them. And a better way to apply it is to look, test, see if it works. If it, great, if it does, great. If not, scrap it as soon as you can and try something else. Okay? Guys, thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Um, I will set up the leap if you guys want to try that out. And I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Thank you.